Good morning. Yes, you've tuned in to the right spot. We're still here as church. We're celebrating Pentecost. This Sunday, we started our journey into the early Christian church and how they first worshipped our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Things look a little different here this morning. And many items throughout the service are going to be noticeably absent or moved or done differently than we did last week. We'll start this journey together as new disciples of our Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and continue our learning each week as we progress towards perfectly, more perfectly worshiping God and loving one another. Let's pray together. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful Enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Christ our Lord, amen. This morning I'll be reading from the 104th Psalms. O Lord, what a variety you have made, and in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your riches. There before me lies the mighty ocean, teeming with life of every kind, both great and small. And look, see the ships, and over there a whale you made to play in the sea. Every one of these demands on you to give them daily food, and you supply it. And they gather it, and open wide your hand and feed them, and they are satisfied with all your bountiful provisions. But if I turn away from them, then all is lost. And when you gather up their breath, they die and turn again to dust. Then you send your spirit and new life is born to replenish all the living of the earth. Praise God forever, how he must rejoice in all his work. The earth trembles at his glance, the mountains burst into flame at his touch. Let all sinners perish, all who refuse to praise him, but I will praise him forever, hallelujah. And would you stand if you're able? Our praise chorus is on 131.
is standing and join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Today is Pentecost Sunday, commemorating the day on which the followers of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit. It is commonly called the birth of the Christian church. Praise God for the Holy Spirit is here among us today. We are told that this is true wherever two or three are gathered together in Christ's name. Christians of Jesus' day would not recognize many of the trappings of a modern church. There were no organs in his day, no computer-generated visual aids, and no amplification systems. Yet one thing has not changed and never will change. The Holy Spirit is still with us as we worship God as followers of his Son. Praise God for being ever faithful to his people and keeping his promises. Today, let us praise our tribute, <clears throat> tribune God and let us seek to do his will so that those who do not know him will learn of him as we tell others by word and deed and the Holy Spirit is with us and is eager to guide us throughout our lives. Praise, Praise God. God. Our opening hymn is on 101. 102. Oh, sorry, can't read. Please be seated. Morning. Morning. Things a little bit different in here this morning? Yes. What's different? I don't know what the front thing is called. You don't know what the front thing is called? Yeah. Oh, the pulpit? The big uh, thing that I usually stand behind with the microphone, that's all covered up? Yeah, and like the whole stuff over there, even the, the fire. The fire, is, the fire is new. There used to be a table up there. Yes. Anything else is different or missing? No 
candles. No acrylate stick. Nope, there's no candles up there either, but we do have a little battery powered candle sitting in that flames right there to make the fire light up. So there's a fan, there's a candle, and then there's some paper. Yep, there's some paper in there. And Makes there, it look like fire. And there's some wood. There's some wood underneath it to make it look like a campfire, yeah. Yeah. You know what the importance of the fire is on today? No. Okay, today's a special Sunday. It's called Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate it like the birthday of the church. Okay. And later on in fellowship time, we're, we're going to have a birthday celebration downstairs, celebrating not only the birthday of the church, but everyone's birthday. We're going to have different tables set up for a table for each month. Mm -hmm. So remember what month you're born in, right? Yep. What month? November. 6th. November. Brandon? April. April. And I was born in September, so we're all going to have to find our own little table to sit at. Okay. So the reason why the fire is important, because yeah. I'm going to read from the Bible later today, just before my sermon, about how the fire of the Holy Spirit came down. And we use the fire as a symbol. Now, it doesn't mean that actual fire came down, but it was like fire. So when we see that fire burning back there, we think about the fire of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So can you tell me what fire is? Really hot. You can't? It, it's hot? Yeah. Okay, fire's hot. That's describing what fire is, but what is actually fire? Probably a star. What's that? A star. A star? Yeah. Okay. Can anyone in the congregation describe to me what fire is? It's a chemical reaction. It's a chemical reaction. That's very scientific. Very good. But think about 2,000 years ago in the early church when they first started meeting. What's that? A light, yeah. Do you think they could describe fire the way that we describe it today? Do you think maybe they thought it was a little bit magical? Maybe. Or maybe they saw something that they didn't know how to describe it, so they called it fire because it was something that they knew. So that's kind of what happened on what we now celebrate as Pentecost. All these disciples were gathered and the Holy Spirit came down on them, and the only thing they could use to describe it was it was like fire. But no one got burned. Isn't that kind of weird? Yeah. yeah. We're going to learn more about it today during the sermon, and maybe during uh, children's worship we'll pick up a little bit more on what Pentecost is. So let's say a quick prayer. Father God, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to be among the first Christians who met and assembled as your disciples. Thank you for sending the apostles to teach the, these early disciples, these early members of your church, and fill them up with the fire of your Holy Spirit, that they may be united as one with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, guys. Bear with me one moment as we are doing things old school, and I have to look at paper in order to figure out where we're going to next. So, uh, hymn of preparation is next. Please stand as you're able. It's from the United Methodist Hymn Number 117, O God, Our Help in Ages Past.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in their own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in the areas of Libya, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other dis- apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will, make, I will cause wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red, before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Like I said, we're doing this old school. So I got a paper copy. Before I get, begin my sermon, I want to preface this by saying this is the start of a 16-week series on exploring the formation of the early Christian church. I am noticeably not in a suit and tie this morning. The theme of my sermons will be on baseball, hence the baseball uniform. And yes, I know, they did not have baseball back in the early Christian church. They also didn't have a building like this back then, but we're trying to make it kind of what they had back then. Will you pray with me? Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you today, now and always. Amen. The late 1960s was a great time of disunity in our nation. People were protesting the war in Vietnam. Race riots occurred in many major cities. Upheaval was prevalent on college campuses. Meanwhile, in baseball, the New York Mets had been the laughing stock of the Major League Baseball for the better part of a decade. The Mets came into existence in 1962 to replace the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers, both of whom had split for California in the late 1950s. They were awful, losing over 100 games for several years. Then in the summer of 1969, The amazing Mets shocked sports fans everywhere. 
They earned a spot in baseball's biggest stage, the World Series. The veteran Baltimore Orioles expected to make quick work of the young upstart Mets. But to further confound sports fans, the Mets beat the formidable Orioles four games to one to capture the first world championship for New York's newest team. Now outside of a few very young pitchers who would become famous later in their careers, there were no stars on the Mets. Guys like, guys like Cleon Jones and Ron Swobodo dominated the headlines of the World Series in 1969, but they are long forgotten today. The Mets had a unity together. They were a team. They had the same goals. No one hogged the spotlight. They knew what no one else knew. They had the prospect of winning the World Series. They played together for that common goal. White men and black men in an age of racial unrest put aside differences to work for the common goal. Men from across the country and from foreign lands came together to play a part of the larger picture. None of those guys individually could have carried a team alone, but when they worked together, they won, and they won very well. There are four aspects of unity that we see here, four things that brought a motley crew of fishermen, a tax collector, carpenters, a former political radical, and others together, including several women, to change the world and light a fire that has been burning for nearly 2,000 years now. The first aspect of unity is the local unity of the church. At this point, it might be helpful to establish a timeline here. The Feast of Passover was the Jewish celebration of the nation's deliverance from Egypt under the leadership of Moses. It is associated with the death of Jesus, Good Friday through Easter Sunday. After Jesus rose again, we are told that he appeared to the disciples for the next 40 days. The day of Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. It was the Jewish celebration of the giving of the law to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. So it is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, which was 10 days after he ascended to heaven. We read in Acts chapter 1, the chapter preceding my reading this morning, that Jesus told the disciples that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. They waited 10 days. Verse 1 tells us when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Acts chapter 1, verses 13 through 14 tells us, and they had entered the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. Together with the women of, in Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Verse 15 tells us that there were about 120 people present at this gathering. Some were fishermen like Peter, James, and John. Matthew had been a tax collector. Simon had been a political subversive. Jesus' brothers were present, and it, was, it is likely that they had been in the carpentry trade. These were people with different backgrounds and different outlooks on life. There was no reason for them to be together, but they had a common reason and a motive to be together as being disciples. There was something deep down in each one of these people that kept them together for this extended period of time. They knew that Jesus had promised them something and they were waiting and praying for it. They found support and encouragement with each other. They knew that there was something bigger than each individual and bigger than even the group as a whole. Together, they were more powerful than they were individually. One individual may have been written off as a crackpot, but a group can offer a more unified witness together. And so we are to be unified. We have a variety of pursuits and vocations among us here. We have a school teacher, we have a nurse, we have a carpenter, we have a business person and others. We should be kept together by the thought that there is something bigger than each of us individually. We have the power of a unified witness together. 
Our reason and motive is the advancement of the kingdom of God. Now that brings us to the second aspect of unity, and that is the objective unity of the church. Our motive and reason lead us to our objective unity. Our objective is given by Jesus to us to go into the world and make disciples. That is the Great Commission. He also equips and prepares us for this. There are two things to note from verse 2. The wind is the symbol of the presence of God. God gave his presence to the believers that day. The fire is the symbol of purification. God purified them that day. We cannot be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Lord until we are cleansed. We must allow the Holy Spirit's fire to cleanse our hearts. We all have a hole in our life that can only be filled by God. The problem is, is that sometimes we want God to fill it, but there is sometimes junk that gets in the way. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to burn that junk out of our lives. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was often given to individuals such as prophets, priests, and kings. Sometime, something is different on this occasion. Our reading tells us that the Holy Spirit rested on each of them, not just the leaders, each of them. Verses 3 and 4 tell us, "...in divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance." We might expect the Holy Spirit to be given to Peter or John or James, and that would make sense. Give the Spirit to the leadership so they can offer a direction. We may even expect those closest to Jesus to receive it also. After all, Jesus' family had thought he was crazy. So why do they deserve it? Remember that Peter had denied ever knowing Jesus when he was confronted. The Holy Spirit was given to every one of them to accomplish the objective of God. There was no distinction between any of them. They all received the Holy Spirit. Later, Peter quoted the Old Testament prophet Joel, And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your, you old men dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, prophesying doesn't necessarily mean telling the future. It has more to do with proclaiming the message of God. The message of God is the good news that Jesus has paid for our sins, and we can have eternal life through him. Very prophetic words, indeed. The truth is that the Holy Spirit is still for all believers today. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come for pastors and leaders in the church. The Holy Spirit is a gift for all believers. This is just as true in the year 2022 as it was in the days of the early church. The Holy Spirit gives us objective unity. Our objective is to see people come to know Jesus. That is the purpose for which we exist. That is why the church is here. The Holy Spirit gave the power of communication to the disciples. People from, different, from 15 different world areas listened to these people tell about Jesus in their own native languages, and they understood them. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to communicate the message about Jesus. He gives us the words to say. I've had pastoral conversations with people thinking, where are these words coming from? The Holy Spirit gives us that ability to communicate, tells us what to say. The third aspect of unity is the willful unity of the church. This is a voluntary association here. No one is held against their will. The unity is stronger because of this voluntary association, because we are willfully here. There are three things entailed in this willful unity. There were many voices, but one theme is the first. The theme was the mighty works of God. 
The assembled crowd commented at the end of verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongue or language the mighty works of God. There were people from at least 15 different world areas listed in verses 9 through 11. They were from as far east as modern-day Iran. They were from as far west as Italy. And there were people from three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, all present that day, and they spoke many different languages. The Holy Spirit empowered the 120 people to speak in languages they did not know. They communicated with 120 different voices, but they communicated one same message, and that was the mighty works of God. They were, success, they were successful because the Holy Spirit had given them unity. Second part is a united goal should produce a united effort. The disciples had a united goal, which was proclaiming the mighty works of God. As a result, they had a united effort. They had one goal, and they all worked to achieve that goal. They gave way to Peter as the crowd became more and more confused about what was happening. The crowd was amazed, astonished, and perplexed. They did not know what was going on. The scene must have been incredible. Think about it. You have 120 people speaking 15 different languages and dialects. The crowd has several thousand people in it surrounding them. Think about just a crowd with a hundred all speaking the same language. This past week we had annual conference down in Traverse City. There were over 1,500 of us gathered in one room and we all spoke the same language. Janet was a little bit chaotic from time to time with everyone talking. <laughs> Imagine 120 with a thousand people or so gathered. Still chaos and no coordination. That is a great deal of commotion. It must have sounded like something crazy. All these people speaking all these different languages. So then the people accused the 120 of being drunk. Who can blame them? It must have sounded like an argument at the United Nations without the translators. <laughs> As a result, Peter stood up and addressed the crowd. The others allowed him to step up and step out and communicate for the whole group. Each of them backed off their egos and allowed them to dispel the myth about the group being drunk. They displayed a willful unity by serving in their role. The third point is a lack of unity hinders growth of the church. Because this group was united, great things happened for the church and the growth of it. Verse 41, later in the reading, tells us about 3,000 people being added to the church that day. A lot of churches have a problem growing because there is no unity. When there are different themes and different goals, the church cannot succeed. There was a great deal of confusion among the crowd that day. But because the church was united, clarity was brought, and growth occurred. Our effort must be united by our one goal. Our voices may be many, but our theme should be one. Our theme must be the mighty works of God. Our goal must be the advancement of the kingdom of God. The fourth aspect of unity is the prospective unity of the church. When we are unified, our prospects for growth go far beyond limited thinking. We can grow beyond what we thought was believable. The Holy Spirit removed that barrier of language that day. Representatives from at least 15 different areas with different languages were present that day. And the Holy Spirit cut through that barrier for one reason, the advancement of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit can remove barriers for us and empower the advancement of the kingdom of God through the Manistique First United Methodist Church. We face many barriers in our community. They may be financial. They may relate to the number of workers available. And we may not have top-notch facilities. We may not be as experienced as others. 
No matter what obstacles we face, the Holy Spirit can help us overcome them. When the crowd said in verse 7, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? They basically meant, are not all those who are speaking a bunch of uneducated, uncultured bumpkins? Galileans were looked down upon because there was a great degree of prejudice against them. The Holy Spirit used them in a mighty way. The message here was simple. At the end of the day, the message was everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That simple message of salvation from sin is a great one. There's no reason to make it any more complicated than that. The message is simple and the effort is united. We must be united as a local body. Our objective must be united. It is a willful unity that we choose to be in together. Our prospects must be united as well. Are we willing to get on the bandwagon together and move forward with one theme, one goal, and one effort? As I turn around and I look behind here on what started a couple weeks ago of, let's look at the early Christian church. And the only guidance I offered was, let's take the furniture out of here and see what the early church looked like before it was today. Wasn't that one united theme, one direction that everyone worked together in to contribute to? And there were people involved with this that came in throughout the week that worked by themselves. Some people worked together, but all accomplished one theme. And we'll be enjoying this for the next five or six weeks or so, as every week we bring back a part of today's sanctuary. Next week we'll re-add some chairs in the Lord's table. The week after that, maybe some candles. The point is, is that we're all moving in one direction. The growth and the advancement of Christ's church here on earth. If the lessons of Pentecost teach us anything, it is that we must have a spirit of unity. When we are unified, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish for the Lord. May it be so. Amen. We go into our prayer time this morning. Are there any gathered here in need of healing? Are there any testimonies that your heart feels compelled to share in praise of our Creator? Please let us share them now, our joys and our concerns. Carrie? You have a whole household? I'm sorry. Oh, no more pain of two houses, one house. Congratulations. Counts up the rent. Okay. Any other prayer requests? Sharon? Your, your sister has fallen. You don't know much about it. Um, she is downstate. Okay. We lift up uh, Penny Tracy, who is at home recovering from COVID, um, as well as uh, Tim, who is with her, um, not showing signs of COVID yet, but prayers that everything will resolve itself with that. We also lift up um, five firefighters that have died in Bangladesh. Um, five firefighters are dead at a fire at an inland shipping container depot in southeastern Bangladesh, and another 21 firefighters have sustained serious injuries, and the fire has killed at least 43 people as of 1 o'clock this morning, our time. We lift them up in prayer. Sarah?
we lift up a young family downstate who has a, a young one with a brain tumor um, in that they're actively involved with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Prayers for them. Any other prayer requests? So I can't hear you. Prayers for a woman from Trenaries whose name is Dolores, who has lost three siblings and a very close cousin recently. Carrie? Praying for a young woman who's homeless, living with you. Sharon? Just want to say a big thank you to Hannah Sloan that she's put in laying in the gardens and on my birthday down the stairs and all of them. Thank you for everyone who just does everything here behind the scenes from tending to the flower garden out front to making our uh, birthday celebration on Pentecost happened to Janet and I were gone for the last three days at annual conference when a lot of this happened um, and just to come back and see it all done and ready to go is, is certainly a blessing thank you let us center our thoughts and our prayers as we sing together our prayer hymn Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us with your love. Open our eyes to see the presence of God all around us. In the stillness of this sacred space. In the busyness and noise of our city streets. In the joys and celebrations of our lives and in the tragedies and struggles that break our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, and comfort those who grieve. Grant them the peace that only you can bring. Stir within us a trust in life beyond death as we ponder the mysteries of Christ's resurrection and the hope we have in new and everlasting life. Come, Holy Spirit, and bring wholeness to the sick. Strengthen those who are weak. Heal the wounded and broken. Give rest to the weary. Come, Holy Spirit, and inspire our warring world to seek peace, to love our enemies and put away our weapons, to remember the price paid for our freedom to care for those who have been, who have served. Come Holy Spirit and ignite a fire in our bones, a passion for justice that cannot be quenched until all of your children are loved, until no one is marginalized or oppressed, until everyone has the opportunity to thrive, until the world is transformed and renewed Come, Holy Spirit, and revive your church. Liberate us from complacency and apathy, 
Inspire us with Christ's vision for a world reborn. Help us to recognize our gifts for ministry and to use them in service of others. Transform our hearts and our minds. Fill us with love that overflows. Remind us that there is no greater calling than to love you with all that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Gracious God, give us a glimpse of your kingdom emerging from around us and drawing us into the new things you are doing in this world. It is for your kingdom that we pray, being filled with your spirit. Amen. Some announcements in the life of the church this week. Monday morning is Bible study at 11 a.m., followed by prayer group at 12 p.m. On Tuesday, the trustees will meet at 10 a.m. Pasty prep will begin at 10.30 a.m., and a UMW meeting will happen at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday is Pasty prep at 7.30 in the morning and with pasty sales from 10 to 1. Saturday, the trustees have a spring work day scheduled in the morning from 9 to 12. I think that's everything that's going on this week. If I missed anything, someone please let me know. <laughs> Made it. And now will our ushers please come forward to receive our offering. God of wind and fire, breathe your Holy Spirit over us again this day. Help us to better hear one another and untangle the differences we have allowed to divide us. May your Spirit give us the power to be the church you had hoped we would be, one body, one people, seeking to build your beloved community of justice, mercy, and hope. As we bring our tithes and offering to you this day, Set us on fire once again. Fill us with your power. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now we have special music by Mary.
as we move into our time of celebrating Holy Communion together, we take pause to remember how the early first Christian disciples celebrated communion together, often in homes. It was called the Eucharistic Celebration. The Eucharist is a celebration of the new Passover. Pascha, or Easter, is the pinnacle of Christian worship. Initially, it is possible in some or many Christian churches the Eucharist was celebrated only once a year at Passover. The celebration of this high feast of Christian worship expanded to Jewish feast days like Pentecost, and by no later than the end of the first century, the liturgical practice of the church was to celebrate every Sunday as like a mini Easter. The Eucharist would have been celebrated early on a Sunday morning, a working day in the Roman Empire. The Eucharist was understood as being the duty of the bishop, and initially we have every reason to believe that all Eucharists were celebrated by the bishop. But as the churches grew in number, this became impractical. By the end of the first century, this duty was being delegated to presbyters, elders, or ministers of each local church. So I greet you. Shalom to each of you. I greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. May peace be with you. And let us now show our signs of peace to one another by exchanging a friendly smile and a wave. And when communion was celebrated in these small environments, in homes, or gatherings together, the members of the home would provide the offering for the communion. So you notice there is no bread, there is no juice up here. The members of this household would come with the elements of communion during the communion service. Just as now we have our communion elements being brought forth. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. We give thanks to you, God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to us in former times as Savior, Redeemer, and Messenger of your will, who is your inseparable word through whom you made all, and in whom you were well pleased, whom you sent from heaven into the womb of a virgin, who being conceived within her, was made flesh and appeared as your son, born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin. It is he who, fulfilling your will and acquiring for you a holy people, extended his hands in suffering, in order to liberate from sufferings those who believe in you, who, when he was delivered to voluntary suffering, in order to dissolve death and break the chains of the devil and tread down hell and bring the just to the light and set the limit and manifest the resurrection, taking the bread and giving thanks to you Take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, the chalice, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. Whenever you do this, do this in memory of me. Therefore, remembering 
his death and resurrection, we offer to you the bread and the chalice, giving thanks to you, who has made us worthy to stand before you and to serve as your priests. And we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to the oblation of your holy church. In their gathering together, give to all those who partake of your holy mysteries the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Toward the strengthening of the faith and truth that we may praise you and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom to you be glory and honor, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, now and throughout the ages of ages. Amen. Please come now as the ushers direct. All things are ready.
Please stand now as you're able for our closing hymn, sung to the tune of 437 with the words, We Pray for Peace. join us downstairs after worship for a time of birthday fellowship together. Remind you to find the table of your birth month and sit at it so that you might sit with people you don't normally sit with. But hopefully we will all speak the same language, or at least the power of the Holy Spirit will allow us to understand each other. And now for a benediction appropriate to the time of the Jewish customs. Shalom Alechem, peace be upon you. And the response from the people is the reverse of that, Alechem Shalom, unto you peace. So, Shalom Alechem.
Joseph White's office. Yes, I am. And you're so great. Thanks for having me up here this morning. I usually have that.